What's happening, everybody? Brent Dax here from Syracuse.com, and we are live on the Syracuse.com, Syracuse Orange Football Facebook page, and we are here following a, who oh boy, not a good one uh, for the Syracuse football team, not what most expected here heading into its bye week, most saying Syracuse with the opportunity to go 5-1 and one for the first time since 1999, into its bye week or be five and one at all for the first time since 1999 Pittsburgh a team that yeah has shown some signs this year that they can be competitive but certainly a team that Syracuse should have beaten straight up despite the fact that they had not won at Pittsburgh since 2001 that trend will continue Syracuse won't have an opportunity to win at Pittsburgh again until 2020 a 44 to 37 loss in overtime at Pittsburgh today. So instead, Syracuse is 4-2 and two going into its bye week, which a lot of people would have taken at the beginning of the season had I told you they could be 4-2 and two at this point. But certainly, uh, losing to Clemson is, you know, expected. And as close as Syracuse came last week, it's one of those things where people were still saying they deserve to be ranked after that. I was one of those people. What a difference a week makes because now you're four and two. And right when Syracuse was on the cusp of breaking through, getting back on the national map, Dino said they were right there after the Florida State game. Uh, they drop one and they drop a tough one to Pittsburgh today. And there's a number of things that we will go over. And this one, you guys, I'm sure, are going to be rattling in the comments there. Again, please comment respectfully. I know you guys are a little fired up here. You could be as critical of the team as you want, you know. I wouldn't rip college kids too much. They are college kids. We, we can be critical of performance. We can be critical of Dino. We can be critical of the team. But let's be fair and uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to sing Kumbaya, but let's be nice to each other in the comments there, okay? Yeah, there's a, a few things in this game. It was a weird game, first of all. It was a longer game. I'm here much later than I expected here this evening. I thought I'd be here in early afternoon, but there was an hour and six-minute delay. All kinds of weather in Pittsburgh today, rain and sun and thunder it's like that's it's like that old song right joy and pain sunshine and rain there was a lot of that at Syracuse in Pittsburgh it kind of describes that game the ups and downs of it the joy the pain the sunshine the rain but at the end Syracuse loses in overtime and there's a couple of things that jump right off the page first of all Syracuse's run defense failed it again it was a lot of not exactly the same way that the Clemson game ended but very reminiscent of how the Clemson game ended and that Syracuse just can't stop the run. Last week it was Travis Etienne. This week it was Quadre Olison. It was a little bit of Hall. It was that Pittsburgh offense, which that's all they have. All Pitt can do is run the football. They ran a little wildcat, a little jet sweep. They mixed up, you know, the formations and the way that they did it. But this Syracuse defense, which has created a lot of turnovers this year and has looked better in parts, is getting gashed by opposing running games. So we know what the priority for Dino Babers, for Brian Ward, and this team is going to be in its bye week, and that is to figure out some sort of patch in order to stop the run because, wow, they can't do it. You know, I'll just uh, pull up the stats while we're uh, talking about it here. So today, uh, Syracuse, 47 attempts, 265 rushing yards for Pittsburgh today. Syracuse actually ran the ball a lot better this week than they did against that vaunted Clemson defense a week ago. They ran for 177 yards. Jarvie and Howard looking good. They did have some running plays in this game. Eric Dungy, who we'll certainly talk about here in a moment, in a different capacity. You know, Syracuse gets out to a 14-0 lead. Pitt comes back. They go into the weather delay. Syracuse out of the weather delay. You know, Puts a couple of scoring drives together, but Pitt just kept coming back and kept coming at that Syracuse defense, particularly the run defense. So total yards today, Pitt ran 67 plays for 402 yards. Syracuse matches it just 80 for 372. And when you look at the second big thing from this game, it is how Eric Dungy was all over the map. The senior quarterback, 18 of 38, two picks on the day. He did throw a short touchdown pass to Aaron Hackett, same play that got called back last week against Clemson, the fourth down play. This time it worked in the end zone. Eric Dungy did rush for 70 yards and a touchdown, including a 29-yard scramble for a score, but it was the play right at the end there. So Syracuse has to respond to Pittsburgh in overtime. Pittsburgh, who yet again runs the ball in for a score. They've got to respond, and Syracuse's response is on the first play, first down, Eric Dungey takes a shot into the end zone under pressure into double coverage. Now, it looked like Nikeen Johnson had a little bit of a stretch 
to he probably could have made it to the corner had Dungey made a good throw there, but he didn't make a good throw. And that was the story of Eric Dungey throughout the day. The senior quarterback really struggled to throw the football. He was under duress a lot of the day, but Eric Dungey's used to throwing the ball under duress, used to, you know, scrambling and throwing the ball. And, you know, he's almost more comfortable doing it that way than kind of sitting in the pocket, which Clemson made him do a week ago. That is a bad decision by Dungey there to throw that football. And, you know, Eric Dungey continues to kind of straddle that line between somebody who's gutsy and will do what it takes to win and just not making smart decisions on the football field. Bottom line is Syracuse is not back in this football game without Dungey because of those touchdown drives that he led, the scoring drives after the break. But he really struggled for the most part up and down. We gave you the numbers here. So, you know, he's certainly got to figure out some things in the bye week. And, you know, Syracuse fans admire his passion. They admire a lot of things they did. That that touchdown run that I mentioned took off and run. Vintage Eric Dungey moment there. Dives for the pylon. You really got to admire the spirit and the guts that this kid shows. But then he makes a play like he did in overtime. It's just all over the place for Eric. So he really struggled. Definitely his worst game of the season. You can understand last week why it was limited because of the defense he was facing. This Pittsburgh defense was nothing special. This Pittsburgh defense, yes, they're physical, and Pat Narduzzi kind of emphasizes that, but they got manhandled, that Syracuse offense. In a lot of ways, we mentioned a couple of positive things. There was a great throw to Custis down the sideline. Taj Harris had a great day catching the ball. We'll give him props in that sense because he found an opening. He had four catches for 64 yards. Custis ended up with three catches for 70. But that big play that I mentioned, that throw down the sideline, Syracuse got away with one there because Jamal Custis didn't catch that football. And smartly, Syracuse went and ran a play before Pitt could call timeout and get the review. Earlier in the game, with 6.17 to go in the third quarter, unlike last week, Dino calls a timeout in a spot where he needed to, got a review, and that worked in his favor. You had the Pitt kicker hit two 50-plus yard field goals and a 45-yarder right at the end of regulation to tie it. Andre Schmidt was great. Booted a 54-yard field goal for Syracuse. I thought Heinz Field was somewhere you're not supposed to make field goals. I guess early in the season, it's fine. Once you get into the the mighty uh, winds of November, it's tough to make kicks in that stadium. But all told, uh, yeah, this this is disappointing all around. Because once Syracuse feels like they're right there, right on the cusp of something again, they kind of pull you back, right? It's Lucy pulling away the proverbial football from Charlie Brown. I think there's a lot of things to look at with half the season to go. There still are some opportunities for Syracuse and teams they certainly can beat. But their their flaw is right out there in the open for all to see. And it's not even a matter of, you know, playing. Now, Travis Etienne is a elite running back. Quadre Olison, who Syracuse recruited heavily, is a really good running back who's made good plays against real good teams, you know, no matter who Pittsburgh is playing. But – Syracuse just cannot stop the run right now. That is a sign of how their linebackers are being exposed, how, look, Alton Robinson, Chris Slayton gets double teamed every play. Kendall Coleman, they do what they can. And Robinson made a number of great plays in this game again. That kid is developing into an NFL talent before our very eyes here. But Syracuse's weakness has been fully exposed here. Pitt's just not a good team. And, you know, look, ACC play, weird things happen in Pitt. It's a league game. It's a, it's, a, it's a rivalry game, right? I don't think Syracuse really has a true rival. They just kind of have some regional rivals in Pitt and Boston College these days. And, look, college football, everybody has that day where things like this can happen. But if you want to be in the conversation of a team that should be in the polls in a wide-open ACC year – that can do some damage, you've got to win these kind of games. So the good news is there's half a season to go. The bad news is the trend the last two years is that the Syracuse defense has just gone into a complete nosedive. And there's signs that that could happen again against the run. There are six games to go. Let's see if they can fix this. This is a relatively healthy team at this point. There's obviously some injuries that we know about. Uh, Antoine Cordy got hurt again today, was on the sideline. Matt Keller, the long snapper. The Owies are piling up. Uh, one thing I didn't know, Devin Butler did not travel with the team today, and that was for a violation of team rules. That was not an injury-related thing as far as we know. It was stated as a violation of team rules, so I don't think we'll ever find out what really happened there. I, I didn't get a chance to catch Dino's press conference before we came on here today, so I'm not sure if he was asked that, but if he was, I'm sure he didn't really get into detail on that one. So let's see what you guys are saying here in the comments. And, again, I would ask that uh, we comment respectfully. Certainly I know you guys are upset here. Uh, Steven saying 600 yards rushing in the last two weeks. Yeah, not good. Not good at all. There's only so much 
that that front line can do. And there's some really talented guys there, but you need your linebackers to back you up when that Pitt offensive line, we knew Pitt was going to run the football. The thing about Clemson is they're Clemson. They're a little more balanced. Even when Syracuse knocked Trevor Lawrence out of that game and Chase Bryce just kind of had to game manage that thing to get through, 12 out of 13 plays on the final drive for Clemson a week ago were runs. And it was Travis Etienne Wright, and it was Travis Etienne Wright, and it was Travis Etienne Wright, Quadre Olson, or Hall. Every time they lined up in that Wildcat formation, they faked the jet sweep and go around the corner. And Brian Ward, you know, if he did tell his team to be there, they're getting pushed around in the fourth quarter of games. And this is a Syracuse team that really emphasizes conditioning. It's not like they haven't done that and they haven't discussed it because when you've got an offense that goes at the pace that they do, you need your defense to be conditioned. And there's, you know, some times when that offense really leaves the defense hanging with quick drives, three and outs, you know, four and outs, and boom, the defense is back on the field. But you can't have all your the juice you need to stop a power-running football team when your defense is getting gassed in the fourth quarter. The depth is a little better on this football team than it's been in recent years, but maybe we're saying that that depth is quite there. And this is not a surprise linebacker-wise. We knew these linebackers were questionable. Andre or Andrew Armstrong, pardon me, made a couple of great plays in this game. Kyler Wintner made a couple of great plays in this game, but consistently these guys just get exposed throughout. So it's not a matter of can you make the linebackers better. It's, it's a matter of what, what can you do to exploit your strengths and hide your weaknesses. And, you know, there's – I go back and forth with this. I actually put up a poll. It, it was such a long day and such a long afternoon. I almost forgot that I did this. And I didn't believe that Syracuse had to do it. But I put up a poll at halftime and I said, just curious, would you put Tommy DeVito in this game? And I should have probably amended that to say if Dungey continues to struggle, do you put in Tommy? Maybe making the change at halftime wasn't there. But Eric Dungey is struggling accuracy-wise throwing the football. And I will contend. I don't want it to sound like I'm – a conspiracy theorist here, but I don't think his arm's 100%. We've mentioned that a few times here. I've said it on the radio. I've said it other places. He just doesn't look like he, he has the arm strength, has a, a healthy shoulder to make consistent throws. Then he'll make a great sideline throw to Jamal Custis, so he'll prove me wrong, as soon, as, but then he'll prove me right on the next throw. He'll air Merrill a, a play. He'll, and these aren't miscommunications with receivers. These aren't, you know – things that, well, he's under pressure, so he should have to throw the ball away. This is Eric Dungey in the pocket with time to throw the football. And we're just not seeing it there when he has to really bear down and throw the ball. He can make some plays and some throws. And, again, they're not in this game without him. we got to be fair here. Getting off to the quick start, the, the, the touchdown drives after they came out of the long delay, the hour and six-minute delay, he's still the senior leader on that team. And, you know, Dino's message after the game was that this team has to stay together with six games to go here. So, you know, the, the, the problem is there's no middle ground with Dungy. He's either great or he's you're scratching your head. He's got to find that consistent middle ground, which he really still hasn't done at times. There's been times he's been brilliant this year. you got to be fair about this kid because you really, you know, a yin and yang's you here at this point. Uh, Garth asks what I think is a pretty good question here, and Dino tried to warn against this earlier this week. Did Clemson beat Syracuse twice? Well, the answer to that is no. I don't think that Clemson beat Syracuse twice, but Clemson and Pitt beat Syracuse for the exact same reasons. They cannot stop the run at this point. Steven's saying, go back to the Big East. <laughs> Football is the best. Yeah, I, I hope you're joking about that, Steven, because no, I don't think so. Uh, let's see, Brian saying, doesn't matter what you do on offense if you can't stop the run. Cannot argue with that. That is 100% correct. And there's only so much you could ask Dungy to do, by the way. Again, to be fair, up that throw at the end, uh, the overtime throw, Syracuse only had one play in overtime. It was that one. Awful. I think some play calling was questionable today. Short yardage situation play calling was questionable today. I thought Dungy made a number of bad decisions in this game. So I don't want to make this sound like I'm just going to defend Eric Dungy to the death here. but. That's not fair to him, what you just said. It doesn't matter what you do on offense if you can't stop the run. If your defense can't stop the run, there's only so much that Eric Dungey can do with that offense to make up for it as well. Uh, William asking, why didn't Syracuse challenge the fourth down conversion with 239 left? It looked short to me. They had a timeout for it. If it's overturned, we win the game. They did review that, William. Those plays are automatically reviewed, and they measured it as well. So I think he got there, by the way. I think on the review – 
And what you need on a review is indisputable evidence. You need, like, there's no way that football is at the 49-yard line. He was there. And I think if we're getting into reviews and we're getting into things, Syracuse got away with one too, William. Jamal Custis didn't catch that football down the sideline. Pitt got a free touchdown in this game. I think this needs to be mentioned. Syracuse lost this game on its own and by the fact of execution and all those football terms. But you know what? Pitt got a free touchdown in this game. Dungey was held up. His forward progress, progress pardon me, clearly wasn't going further. And the, the officials waited like a five count to blow the whistle. Blow the darn whistle. The play is dead. Pitt gets a fumble, fumble, and runs up the field for a touchdown. That's inexcusable. That is an awful call by the officials. And I'd say the same thing about Pitt. I would say the same thing, okay? Officiating, it's easy for me to pick on. It's easy for you to pick on. We see five replays. That's not the case there. I could count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four. That's too long. There's five people gang tackling Eric Dungy, and they don't blow the whistle. That was awful. That was a free touchdown for Pittsburgh. Did it cost Syracuse the game? No, it did not. Was it inexcusable that something like that can happen? That's absolutely inexcusable. Rob noting inexperienced linebackers are hurting this team in the trenches when it comes to stopping the run it needs to improve overall maybe it can be said that in terms of coaching Pitt was better prepared than Syracuse on both sides of the ball today Pitt deserved to win for sure but maybe we're starting to realize and hopefully respect that the Coastal Division is the more superior in the ACC the Coastal is certainly the more unpredictable division in the ACC because over here in the Atlantic it's you know it's Clemson and the Pips if you will uh, let's see. David says, need different defensive alignment for Pitt. We know the linebackers are challenged. And it's at the point, the frustrating thing there, David, and anybody that wants to bring that up, is even if you put these linebackers in the right position, they're not tackling well. They're run down in the fourth quarter. They're getting run over. There was that – I want the, – the game got so high scoring, I'm trying to forget uh, – remember what touchdown it was – here, I'll look up my notes while we're yakking about it here. But there was that one sideline play. Was it the first touchdown that Pitt scored in the second half where he just ran down the sideline? Yeah, it was the first play. So Pitt comes out. Uh, this was before the weather delay, by the way. So Pitt comes out, and there was just awful tackling. It was a little short pass, and I forget who it was for Pitt, but he just rumbles 68 yards for the score. There's nobody there to get this guy. So – that's in the third quarter, out of halftime. And everybody's, you know, nobody's there to knock him out of bounds. Nobody's there to just make a routine play. So even if you're putting these linebackers in a position to make plays, lining them up right, be there, they're just getting beat. They're just flat out getting beat. This is just, I hate to say it, it's just not a good group of linebackers. So Brian Ward, Dino Babers, the whole defensive uh, staff, they've got two weeks now. You've got a bye week to figure out how do we patch this because we're not going to fix it. I don't think you can fix this. You need talent to fix that kind of problem. The question is how do you patchwork this thing and work around it going forward? Uh, Tom makes a great point. Lots of one-arm tackles and blown coverage. Larry saying you can't lose to pit. Tackling was horrid. I can't disagree with any of that. Uh, Adam brings up another solid point here. I just saw this pop up. First and five in the third quarter, Syracuse runs the ball up the middle three times for four yards and a punt. Orange is the new conservative. Yeah, that was brutal. That was That's what I was bringing up earlier with some of that bl uh, bad play calling and questionable decision-making there. There were some good decisions, too. I liked some of the play calls. I liked um, the timeouts that Dino called. He, he did call timeout in the fourth quarter this time when his defense needed a breather. Clearly, you know, you could have five timeouts in your back pocket. It's not going to help that defense, but I, I like that he at least did that and reset things. He was smart to call a timeout to get a replay that gave Syracuse a key play back. Uh, it doesn't matter now because Pitt won, but Pat Narduzzi didn't get a timeout in, couldn't stop the clock before the Jamal Custis catch that wasn't. So I'll give Dino some credit on a few things today, but there were just so many conservative calls, questionable calls. And uh, how about the safety that got, Adam, on that note, the safety that got called back, it is, what, third down on the goal line, third and 13, I want to say, and you're throwing a screen pass? Not only are you throwing a screen pass, you're throwing it, lat it's almost a lateral. What? Did Dungy, like, uh, audible that, or was that your call? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? 
third and 14 and that's your call? I just There were a few calls in this game. You know, just unbelievable. Like I said, though, the good news is they're four and two and they've got a bye week and North Carolina stinks. <laughs> so they can really come out and really get back on track against that team. NC State squeaked by Boston College today. Ryan Fitt. Now, you're going to have the – I don't want to jump too far ahead of North Carolina. North Carolina stinks. You should beat that team. And I thought Syracuse would beat this team today, so don't take anything for granted. But you're going to have the opposite problem with NC State because Ryan Finley can pick you apart. Ryan Finley is one of the best quarterbacks Syracuse is going to play all year. So there's going to be so much hyper-focus on fixing the run, and there needs to be. But Ryan Finley can pick on that secondary coming up. So here's the other problem. You're right on the brink of not only getting back in the top 25 and getting back on the national map and some of these things that people were discussing throughout the week, and, and I was one of those people, I'll be honest with you. Think of you go into your bye week five and one. People are feeling great about Syracuse football. You got two home games coming out of that bye, and they're not the sexiest home games in the world. North Carolina, NC State, had Syracuse got it into the polls and taken care of business against Carolina, that could be a matchup of two top 25 teams. But by and large, these aren't teams that bring a lot of, you know, fair weather fans to the dome. They're not big ticket sellers. It's not a big ticket game in a way. Now you put your fan base back into wait and see mode as opposed to I'm in. You're five and one. You're ranked. You're looking great. You're taking care of business. I'm in. Now you're going to have a challenge to sell tickets to those games. I mean, there'll be the usual, you know, 38, 39,000 there and 39,000 people can make a lot of noise, but you would have got a wave of Fairweather fans who would have put off apple picking for one of those games and gone to watch this football team. So that's out the window for the Orange as well. Uh, let's see. Ed saying Pitt supposedly stinks too. Yeah, allegedly, right? Uh, Steve saying North Carolina beat Pitt. Yes, they did. It was a shootout. It was a 38-35 game. It was kind of two bad teams that couldn't stop each other, but they did. They did win that game. Uh, Daniel saying no way they beat Notre Dame. It's going to be a lot tougher now. Notre Dame can certainly run the football. Ian Book, I want to see what Notre Dame does tonight at Virginia Tech. That is one of the toughest places to play in college football, and sometimes that's just it. Can I add that to the discussion about this game? You go to Pitt, there is no one there. There is no one there. They have no home field advantage. It was homecoming at Pitt. Everybody stayed home. It was, there were more yellow seats than you could count in that place. You went into a building with no one there, no decided home field advantage against a team that you matched up with and won pretty much every advantage, big one being, of course, you can't stop the run. Just add it to the list of, of excuses to why Syracuse should have won this game and shouldn't have lost this game, I should say. Uh, a few more comments here from you guys. Appreciate you hanging out, by the way, on your Saturday afternoon. Hope you got a, a big weekend plan and some good things happening. Let's go Red Sox. So I got the red on today, baby. Let's hope my blood pressure is a little more calm than last night's game. They won. That bullpen, though. Hey, it's a good thing we've got David Price, a proven postseason pitcher, going tonight. Right? Yeah. 0-8 in the postseason. So I, I think I'm going to be stressed out watching this one tonight. Uh, let's see. Steven noting that maybe Baber should ask Bayheim how to play some zone defense. I did see the comments. Didn't see him last week. Saw him this week. Is it basketball season yet? Media Day's Friday. Orange Madness is Friday night at the Carrier Dome. If you're here local, want to see the orange-white scrimmage coming up. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Kevin saying the line didn't lie today. Where did, did, where did it finish, Kevin? Was it? I think it finished at 7, right? So did it finish at 6.5 or 7? I mean, Pitt covered one way or the other because they were either plus 6.5 or plus 7, but – there's a reason they build a lot of hotels in Vegas. There's a reason every time you go to Vegas, there's a lot of cranes in the air, right? They're always building things in Vegas. And even when they're destroying things, they build something else in its place. Those boys know what's happening. And, and it's going to be all over the country pretty soon, right, with the Supreme Court decision to legalize gambling in individual states. And uh, for entertainment purposes only, of course, that's really going to pick up. So what do you say? We It was three and a half, Stephen? Okay, I didn't, I, I didn't see that it dropped. That far down. Did, maybe it did, did it open big and then drop down after that. Either way, Syracuse didn't cover. So there you go. Let's say we end on that note. You guys try and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy your Saturday. Let's go Red Sox. Uh, we're not going to be here next week on Facebook Live. 
because obviously Syracuse is off. So the next time we'll chat here is on October 20th following the North Carolina game. I will give a couple plugs, though. One plug, Orange Weekly. It's a video that Nate Mink and I do every Thursday, and we discuss Syracuse football. We're going to start getting into basketball pretty soon. We will have a show next week. We will do kind of a bi-week edition of Orange Weekly. So look for that Thursday on Syracuse.com. Subscribe to our Syracuse Orange YouTube channel. Look for it on my social media, Brent Axe Media on Twitter. And uh, you can find it there. The Syracuse Sports Podcast, I would uh, encourage you to subscribe to that in iTunes or Google Play or, or find it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I had a, a very interesting conversation with Mike Powell this week, the former Syracuse lacrosse player who's now a recording artist and a darn good one. We went real deep on his new album and talked a little lacrosse as well. Uh, Nate, Stephen Bailey, and I did a big football podcast before that. So you can find the Syracuse Sports Podcast on iTunes and Google Play. Hope you can check that out as well. In the meantime, thanks for coming by today. Syracuse loses to Pitt in overtime, 44-37. to Thanks to our friends at Krause Health for sponsoring our Facebook live chat. And we'll talk to you again on the 20th. Remember, we're not here next week, bye week. Next Facebook live after the North Carolina game, October the 20th. Thanks, everybody.